Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord God, and we are just in awe of who you are and what you've done and how in spite of our finiteness, Lord, you love us, Father. And even though we, our hearts are wicked and we wander from you, Lord, uh, we do things that we shouldn't do. God, you love us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And God, that is so wonderful. And I just pray, Lord, that as we do this study, that we would only be reassured in the reasonableness of our faith in you and the hope that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um, last time we, I talked about um, Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes and that Solomon was what's called, an, well, I would call him an existentialist, at least initially. And then the whole message was, I mean, I, I know that's a weird word, but philosophers will find something that's very um, common knowledge and then they'll give it some big word, <laughs> But basically what it means is um, he was looking at everything through the eyes of uh, a person who doesn't believe in God. Because he was looking at, at how um, everything we do and work, it's all vanity. Everything's vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all, you know, you work and you slave and then you die. And then all that just goes to, you know, your relatives or, you know, you might be a charitable person, but what is it, you know, you give, but people just take the money and you die. And it's like, it's a very downer book that you read till you get to the very end. And then he has this like, unless you're doing it for God, little message at the end. So your motivation needs to be God. Otherwise it's pointless. So. Uh, as part of that, we trace through kind of the history of thought in man from from back uh, the Renaissance and then the Reformation, the um, what's called the Enlightenment period, and how people became more and more humanist. Now, humanist, atheist, materialist, those all kind of mean the same thing. They're people who don't believe in God, Okay. And the humanist movement started out with people realizing their potential, that they had the power of reason, and that they could, without God, be the captain of their own ship, as it were, that they could, through the power of reason, they could come up with uh, morals and values and purpose and kind of they would be able to figure out the universe and what it all means. So that, and it was very hopeful. They figured it, now that we freed ourselves from God, we are free to do what we are capable of doing. Well, that philosophy has been going on since then. Um, some brilliant minds like Leonardo da Vinci, way back when this was all getting started, figured out that even though he was a humanist and he tried finding meaning in a life without God, it left him in despair. He, he died a rather depressed person. But still, people marched on with this whole idea that God doesn't exist and we're going to get it all figured out. Um, so anyway, we just touched on that briefly and, and um, Reuben asked me afterwards, um, to come back and kind of go into this humanism thing a little bit more. And see, we're always put on the defensive, it seems, as Christians. You ever notice that? I mean, like, whenever it's Easter or Christmas, you, the billboards go up by these atheist organizations. It says, isn't it time to drop the myth? You know, it's time to believe in the truth. There are no Easter bunnies, no Santa Claus, no God. You know, and they put them up on billboards. And we're, we're constantly being told that, you know, that God and the Bible and this, you know, immortality living on eternally is a myth. 
And it's unreasonable to believe in that. Well, actually, the opposite is what's true. And that's what I want to point out today. Is we're going to go through and we're going to talk about what it is to be an atheist. Because a lot of atheists don't really take what they believe to its logical conclusion. I think what you'll see as we go through here, a lot of the people you know that don't believe in God, they will, they will criticize you for your blind faith. And yet, we find if we just ask them a few questions about what they believe, um, it takes a lot more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. And sometimes if you can lead them along and show them what they believe, in the end, you might actually be able to have an inroad with them. I mean, I've, I've talked to some people, and I, one guy I'm thinking of in particular, it was just like somehow the whole idea of all oh, the creation evolution thing came up. And he goes, look, if you're going to bring up the Bible, I don't even want to talk to you. Don't even bring it up. No God, no Bible. You know, that's all been proven wrong. Uh, I don't even want to hear it. So I said, okay, well, let's talk science, because that was my background. I said, let's talk science. And that's a whole teaching on another day. But <laughs> pretty soon by the end of it, he was like, oh, okay, okay. Well, okay, maybe God's possible. And that's what we're after. So anyway, let's look and see. What is the atheist really saying? He's saying that there is no God. And there is no immortality. So we as Christians believe in God, and we believe there's a life after death. The soul does not die. Okay, Our spirit goes on to be with God. They're saying, no, that's all a myth. So, okay, if that's the case, now this is going to be, I know Rubens talked about the passing of his brother, brother-in-law, and this first part. Remember, you're Christians here, at least I hope, and if not, hopefully you will be at the end. But, this can be kind of depressing, and that's the whole point when you listen to what they believe in and you take it to its logical conclusion. So if there's uh, no God and no immortality, then there's no ultimate meaning to life. I mean, what, what is your life worth? What does it mean? Why, why are we here? If there is no God, then the universe and man are doomed. Right? Because the universe, science tells us that the universe, um, you know, the Big Bang Theory, uh, the atheists, the evolutionists, they all say that in the beginning there was nothing and then it exploded. <laughs> so it's like, okay. So nothing exploded and all of a sudden this universe just starts, stuff's going out there, matter's being created. And time was created at the same place. So you got time, matter, and space. And it's just like an explosion. Stuff's flying out into creating the universe. You got galaxies starting to form and spinning around. Some are just going off in the endless space. Some are just banging into each other. Things are flying left and right. Okay. So that's cool. Then some planets are cooling, stars are cooling, some are collapsing on themselves, earth gets formed, life develops on earth, and then what? Well, it just keeps going. Science tells us that the universe is going to continue to expand, and then it's going to die, because what happens is all that heat energy, heat goes to cold, travels to cold. If anybody works in refrigeration or air conditioning, you know that that you know, you have heat exchangers, and it takes the heat and it draws it out. Heat wants to go towards cold. That's true with everything that's flying around out there. Space is expanding, and it's dying. And eventually, it's going to just be cold, dark nothingness. The stars will die. All the matter will collapse in on itself. Black holes will develop. There'll be no light, no heat, no nothing. So what was the point? So what is the meaning of that? What if the Big Bang never happened? What difference would it make? None. 
But what about man? Since we are a part of this universe that's spinning around out there, when it dies, if we haven't killed ourselves off prior to that, <laughs> um, we're all gone. We're dead. We're doomed. We're riding. It's like being on the Titanic. There's no escape, no hope. It doesn't matter if you could be the most influential person in the world. You could be changing people's lives. You could be bringing peace to the world. You could do all of that. But what does it really mean if in the end we're all dead? So that's a real cheery message. That's, that makes me want to be an atheist right there, right? Okay, so the only significance, because you say, well, yeah, but in the meantime, you've made life better for people. Yeah, that's, remember, uh, both Ruben and I have talked about the difference between objective and subjective. You know, objective truth is it's true no matter who, no matter what, no matter where or when. Subjective, it's all about me, okay? Mocha almond fudge ice cream is truly the best ice cream, okay? But that's not really a truth, is it? That's a preference. That's subjective, okay? If I were a diabetic and I said, I need insulin or I'll go into diabetic shock and die, that's a truth. That's not preference, okay? So objectively, no meaning. No God, there's no meaning to life, to this universe. Um, so we're basically a doomed race in a dying universe. So what about value? Everybody, I mean, we're talking about values all the time. And if there's no, um, let me get ahead of myself there. Hold on a second. If there's no um, ultimate value without God and immortality, what does that mean? Well, without value, uh, without immortality, there are no consequences, right? I mean, if this is all there is, if at the end, when you die, there's nothing after that, then I'm not going to have to answer for anything I have done, right? Right? So I can live as I please. Matter of fact, I'd be a fool not to. Because if this is all there is, the universe is dying and everything else, then I better get everything I want now for me. All that matters is me. And the only reason I would help anybody here would be because it would benefit me. Really? I mean, that's... Think about it. Take it to its logical conclusion. Um, morals and values become, again, subjective. It's whatever suits me. And, you know, you hear people all the time say, well, you know, well, that's fine for you. So everybody's got different morals. Sad thing is this is what they're teaching in our schools. So you kind of wonder... When Columbine happened, if you remember, you guys remember Columbine, the two boys went in and shot up all those students. And I remember being at work and people were saying how awful that was, and of course it is. I'm saying, yeah, I agree. But when the people that run these schools are talking about how awful this is, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you taught those boys that there are no morals and values other than what you make. They teach them there are no absolutes. They teach them that there is no objective truth. So to me, I'm thinking, according to your system, these guys are the valedictorians of their class. They figured it out. They took it to the logical conclusion. If these other students make me mad, why not just blow them away? What difference does it make? 
we're all spiraling off into deep space and we're all going to die anyway. There's no life after death, immortality, so why not? I'm never going to have to answer for this. We're creating this ourselves by teaching this stuff. Morals become and values become subjective because there is no God. There's no higher standard by which we judge everything. There's no accountability in the end when you, when you take it to its logical conclusion. What about purpose in life? We all like to think that we're here for a purpose. But again, without God or immortality, there is no ultimate purpose. Now, I keep saying ultimate because remember, we're taking this, you know, you may have this subjective or relatively purpose or meaning or value, but ultimately, we're talking if there is no God, no more, in the very, the final analysis, it all means nothing. And you have no purpose. We're taught by evolutionists that we are created by chance, purposeless processes. So we're basically a mistake. <laughs> so when have you ever had a mistake that, you know, really amount to anything? I mean, the universe doesn't even know we're here. I mean, nobody knows we're here except us. I remember uh, uh, Shirley MacLaine, the actress, you know, saying she's on the beach shouting, I am God. And uh, <laughs> just thinking the universe is out there going, do you hear something? <laughs> I mean, come on. So anyway, uh, we're products of chance, purposeless processes. There is no reason or purpose for our existence. There is no goal of life except what you personally choose. And that's what they teach in schools too. Life is what you make it, make of it. Okay, I make of it that these guys are ticking me off. I'm taking them out. Who's to say those guys, those Muslim guys in Paris, who's to say they're wrong, really? And man, I'm telling you, think about it, because that's kind of the way the press is handling it. They really, they really do don't want to say these guys were wrong. They don't want to say that they're, you know, terrorists. Because we only, we want to be nice to everybody, and we want to, you know, everybody is right, nobody's wrong. It's dangerous. Um, in Ecclesiastes, again, uh, Solomon wrote in a verse, uh, chapter 3, 19 through 20, for what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all return to the dust. Francis Crick, who was uh, one of the two, uh, Watson and Crick were the two guys that, two scientists that uh, actually d discovered the true nature of DNA, the structure, the you know, the helical structure of DNA. He's a biologist and, uh, an avowed atheist evolutionist. Um, he said, we are electrochemical machines. That's all we are. Any, any thought of autonomy, uh, of freedom, of um, reason, purpose, anything, that's all the chemical stuff that's going on in your brain. It's not real. Any any idea that you have any kind of purpose or mission in life or whatever. It's just, it's an illusion, basically. It's just chemical reactions going on in your brain. Uh, the 
the whole relative thing about this morality and values. When I, I taught a worldview class to you know some high school kids, and we homeschooled. We had a pretty large homeschool group, and I would teach a worldview class. And uh, so, as a project, how many of you are Star Trek fans in here? The old Star Trek, Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock. Yeah, that's the okay. Well, do you remember the Prime Directive? Remember the prime directive? It was there. They're not to get involved. They're not to, you know, you got to let people on these on the various planets work things out for themselves. You know, it was the whole thing about there's no right or wrong. We don't want to get in there and influence them and change anything. We could change their whole course of history, blah, 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 blah. So I had that all printed out. I don't remember the exact quote, but I had the whole exact quotation, the whole prime directive printed out and then I printed out okay World War II at the end of World War II there was the Nuremberg trials right the Nuremberg trials are where they were trying all the Nazis for war crimes and their primary defense was hey we were just doing what we thought was right who are you to judge so I said okay here you got the prime directive we're all Star Trek fans. Here you got a real life situation. You have Nazis that murdered 7 million Jews, untold number of innocent people. Who are we to judge? They were doing what they thought was right. So we, we start, when we go down that path where there is no God, no immortality, then all that becomes relative and who are we to judge? So we have really no meaning. We have no ultimate purpose or value. So, uh, why do I want to be an atheist? Of course, that's not a reason not to be one. I mean, if that's the truth, then that's the truth. Okay? None of that proves that Christianity is true, right? I mean, just because that is as bad as it is, if it's the truth, it's the truth. And I guess we just live with it. But they've come up with uh, methods of dealing with this, the atheists. And it's what I, you know, we talked about before was this um, in the last time, well, the existential methodology. I'll touch on that in a second. But um, I think most atheists just have their blinders on and they don't want to think about that, okay? It's sort of like going to the cafeteria where you can, you know, you say, well, I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but I don't want anything that's green on my plate, you know, vegetables, and, you know, and then I'll have the desserts and so they're just kind of pick and choose. So a lot of atheists, it's just like, I like the fact that I can do what I want when I want to do it and not feel like I have to justify it. They don't ever want to think about what that ultimately means, okay? But those that do go that far and take it to its ultimate, ultimate meaning, like Francis Crick did when he said, you know, we're just electrochemical machines. We're just a cog in the wheel Universe is like this giant machine that's just cranking endlessly. Well, not endlessly. It's eventually going to wear out. And, but we're just some little spoke in a wheel somewhere. So Bertrand Russell, who is a, a famous atheist, um, I don't know, back in the 70s, 80s or something, I think he was pretty prolific, uh, said, we must build our lives upon the firm foundation of unyielding despair. Wow. Okay. Sign me up. <laughs> Jean-Paul Sartre, who is a, another philosopher, said, find meaning by finding a course of action. Now, he happened to choose Marxism, which... 
again, it's kind of inconsistent because Marxism really, I mean, whether you agree with Marxism or not, it purports certain morals and values, which in a atheistic worldview, how, why would you fight for something like that when you know ultimately it doesn't mean anything? Um, then they came up with this, what I talked about last time uh, from Francis Schaeffer's book. Um, he points out that there's this, what they call the leap of faith. Okay, so they've determined that through reason, we basically come up with despair, pessimism, no value, no meaning to life, no purpose. So what they do, kind of like what uh, Bertrand Russell, or not Bertrand Russell, but Jean Paul Sartre was saying is like, just find something that makes you feel good about yourself. You know? So, hey, if you want to choose religion, so you know that all of this on the lower story is, you know, reason is absurd. It just leads you to despair. So to combat that, just make something up that makes you feel happy. So if you want to get into save the animals, if you want to join some occult or religion, or you want to, uh, I don't know, be an environmentalist um, or whatever, whatever kind of makes you feel good. Okay, that's when you encounter these people and say, oh, you're a Christian? Oh, that's nice for you. But me, I'm, I'm really putting my life into saving the environment. Okay. To what end? I mean, it's all gonna it's all gonna burn up in the end anyway. Uh, so anyway, in um, Plato wrote, um, you know, Plato, Socrates. There was Socrates. Plato was his student. Aristotle was his student. Anybody know who was one of Aristotle's students? Alexander the Great. That's kind of an interesting. He was a student of Aristotle. But anyway, um, Plato wrote in his, uh, the Republic, book on the Republic, it's all this dialogue about, uh, they're kind of interesting because it's just dialogue. He and the people around. Actually, he writes, a lot of the dialogues have to be what Socrates was doing. In this case, he writes about Socrates in, in these dialogues with his friends. And they're talking about, you know, forming, what does it take um, in this particular case, you know, a, a city-state. And in, in the Greek period, back in the, was it, these guys are around, what, third or fourth century BC in Greece. And Greece wasn't like the state of Greece now. It was all these little city-states, not so little, Athens and so on and so forth. And, uh, you were more of a loyal citizen to your city-state than you were to that whole peninsula. So, but what does it mean? A lot of these philosophers at that time were like on hire by the city-states to say, how should we put this all together and make it work? How do we form a city-state and yet keep people in their place? You know, we have the elite, we have the... the um, you know, trades, um, business type people, and then we got the serfs that have to do all the hard labor and everything. How do we structure that? Because they had no God, they had gods. The gods were just, they were like people. They were as messed up as the people were. Um, so anyway, they had to come up. I mean, really, you look at it, you go, Oh, you know, and you read about this God who was the illegitimate child of this God with this human, and that, you know, it's like the the jealousies and the the fighting between them. It's like, yeah. Uh, although it's fun, I, I have this book called Bullfinch's. Uh, the guy's name is Bullfinch. Uh, uh, it's a book on mythology and stuff, and it's really fun to read. Um, but um, so anyway. Plato in, in the Republic talks about the noble lie. And what you need to do is come up with this, this lie that you tell everybody or this mythology or whatever that 
explains why people need to do what they need to do within the society and that it's for the good of the state, the city-state, that they do that and that their loyalties, it, it, it somehow make, gives an explanation of why they should be less subjective about everything and more uh, inclined to do what's good for the community. Now, how you get that started and everything, uh, the one he was, he purported was based on some um, myth from somewhere else. I can't remember now, a long time since I've read that. But um, if you can convince everybody of this lie, then you could, you know, perpetuate that. And then everybody would just be happy with their state where they are. I think of India kind of comes to mind with their caste system over there. It's like if you're the lowest of the low, then it's because of, you know, reincarnation. It's because you you did something wrong in a prior life to deserve that. See, there's no upward mobility in that kind of a system. And there's a lot of things that happen in that that are, because if now if you are at the top, you know, then everybody below you is there because they deserve it and you can treat them accordingly. And just hope, you hope for the best in the next life. You know, when you get reincarnated, maybe you'll move up a little, you know. So just keep your place, mind your place, do what you're told, and then maybe in the next life you'll, you'll move up. So that's the kind of stuff we wind up with, with these, there's no God, no immortality. Well, I guess that's kind of an immortality, but a pretty brutal one. Um, So we see, let's talk about the consequences. We already talked about some of the consequences of humanism. and, And, you know, culturally, we have things that happen like the Holocaust. Uh, We have totalitarian governments. Uh, We have lawlessness, we have loss of a sense of community because everybody's kind of out for themselves, you know. And personally, there's apathy, uh, things like substance abuse, physical abuse. Uh, we talked about Columbine was an example of these kind, this kind of philosophy and what it, how it manifests itself. So you see, once God is denied, we become worthless, no dignity. There was a uh, Richard Wormbrand. He was a Christian. He was the Russian that was in the, you know, was a prisoner in these um, in Siberia or whatever, tortured for his faith. And, And I think it was him that was talking about one of the guards was telling him, I thank the God I don't believe in that I can do, I can express all the evil that's in my heart. (laughs) How'd you like that guy to be your guard? (laughs) So it's not a very rosy picture for the atheist. And I don't know why you'd want to be one. But again, like I said, that doesn't necessarily make Christianity true. The fact that what they're going through, what they believe. So, does Christianity really have an answer? Or is Christianity a leap of faith? Like those mentioned above. Or... Is it just the noble lie? I mean, this is, I like to think this is a little more informal than others, but how would you answer that question? Is Christianity uh, just a noble lie, or is it just a leap of faith? What, what do you think makes, is it different, and if so, why? Anyone want to venture a guess? <laughs> I 
Yes, Lewis. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you stepping out there because, yeah, but let me put it this way. You say you use the word faith. Now, to an atheist, that just means a leap. Yeah. So. Okay, now, yeah, you're on to something there, too. We need something objective, right? We need something, and, and people say, well, the Bible, you know, you say you believe in the Bible. It's just a circular argument. It's true because the Bible says it's true. But that's not the case. Miracles, prophecies that have come true. So we see truth claims in the Bible that have come true. One of the things that convinced me when I was, well, I was in college, I was your typical hedonistic uh, um, college student uh, party and drinking and carousing, uh, to put it mildly. And, uh, but somebody gave me a book called The Late Great, Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And I actually read it. And uh, the thing that really got me about that was he spends the first part of the book talking about the biblical prophecies and how 80% of them have come true 100% exact. So then his point was the 20% that's left to doing with the end times, what's the chances that those will also come true exactly as they are stated? And I thought, well, that's a pretty strong argument. And I didn't know the Bible or anything, so I was... I was just taking him at his word that those things actually, those prophecies that he talked about. But some of them I did know. I mean, I'd gone to church as a kid, and that's a whole other story. But um, just there's something like 300 prophecies concerning the birth of Christ. Or not the birth, but I mean the birth in his life. And we know pretty much that all came true, just as it was said. So uh, you have all these other prophecies so the Bible, it isn't necessarily a circular argument. Okay, so that's where we want to go with this. And that's where it gets us to what's called apologetics. Apologetics, that word comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a defense. So Christian apologetics, we defend the faith. Sometimes the best defense is an offense. We've been on the defense way too long. <laughs> so, First Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to give a reason. We have a reasonable faith. This isn't, this isn't blind faith. This is a reasonable faith. We have evidence and proof. We cannot prove scientifically that God exists. Why? Because science deals with the physical universe. That's not the right tool. That's like trying to weigh a chicken with a yardstick. <laughs> Actually, you can do that because you can make a balance out of it. But technically, you get the point. You don't weigh a chicken with a yardstick. You don't try and prove metaphysical things with science. You can't do it. You would have to be, in order to say that, you'd have to be everywhere in the universe at once. And if you were able to accomplish that, 
guess what? You're probably God. <laughs> so, no, you can't prove God scientifically. And it, it's, even the Bible tells us it's really a matter of faith, but it's not blind faith. It's a reasonable faith. So apologetics is a field of study that helps us with the defense. There's arguments that we use to make us understand that there really is evidence for what we've learned in the Bible about God and immortality. Remember, I mean, how many of you have been on juries? Actually, I've never been on a jury. <laughs> I guess I put my hand down. Um, you know, I, I go, and I, I've never, I've come so close to getting selected, and but I've, I've never been on one. Um, but if you're ever in that process, and I'll tell you if it's a felony case, that you have to understand that a felony, you can be convicted of a felony on circumstantial evidence. You don't have to have an eyewitness, okay? So, um, you know, nobody had to see Colonel Mustard kill the guy in, in the study with the lead pipe. But if you have enough evidence that makes it clear that he's the guy that did it, you can convict. So we don't necessarily have to have like somebody to say, oh yeah, I saw God. Yeah, he, I've talked to people. Like, you go, ever go street with a seat and you get these people like, oh yeah, Jesus? Yeah, he was down at the Burger King over here just the other day. He was sitting with Elvis. Um, so no, but what, with apologetics, we can have enough evidence to where we can make it, make someone start to think twice about things. Um, if you can take somebody, because if somebody that thinks that, well, the existence of God is just impossible. Just forget it. But with apologetics, okay, let me ask you this. If do you need more evidence to prove something is possible or more evidence to prove that it's probable? What's easier to prove? No, 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 no. Think. It's easier to prove something's possible. I mean, you've had these conversations with people, you know, and it's like, you know, well, I can see how that's possible, but it's probably not probable, right? Because probable takes a little more proving. But that's what apologetics does for us. We can take the impossible and make it possible, and then as we add more and more evidence, God becomes probable. And then we can take it from there. Then, boy, hit them with the gospel. Um, but anyway, so what are these arguments? Well, there's a lot of arguments. I'm not going to go. I'm just going to mention a couple of them because that's, again, there's a whole series of studies a whole uh, courses in college on this stuff. But, okay, we have things like what's called the cosmological argument. In other words, where did the universe come from? Okay, we have the Big Bang Theory of the atheists, but we have the creation story. And it's one of the simplest, actually, it's one of the simplest arguments. Do we not live in a, a cause and effect universe? I mean... That's what this argument basically is called the Kalam cosmological argument. It says, all things that begin to exist have a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore there was a cause. Now, that, that's just telling you now that God is possible, right? But then you say, well, who was, who was the cause or what was the cause? Was it personal or impersonal? Well, let's look at the universe. What do we see? We see it's, it's ordered, it's structured, it's precise. It's perfectly suited for our existence. Sounds more personal than impersonal, don't you think? Okay, well, what about this personal God? Well, we just think. I mean, uh, like Descartes said, uh, I can deny all kinds of things, and I get down to denying myself. 
Yeah, I don't know if you ever heard that expression, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Well, Descartes said, I can't deny my own existence, I exist. Otherwise, who's denying, who's saying that? I am. Well, what am I? Well, I'm a thinking thing. What kinds of things do I think? Well, I have thoughts of perfection, but I don't know anything that's perfect. Where do I get an idea like perfection? Well, it had to come from something that, or someone that has that. That, that has given it to me. Therefore, there must be God. So I exist, God exists. Now God is probable. So who, which God is this? Is it the God of the Muslims, God of the Bible? Then you could go in and start arguing more. So you see how these arguments become useful in making people realize you don't have to live hopelessly. How about there's a theological argument basically is how did that how did that plant know what is it in New Zealand and Australia there's a plant a flower and that flower has this big lower petal it looks like kind of a big iris and this petal has this weird design on it well that design there's these bees these big bumblebees and the female bee when they're going to mate the male comes over and picks up the female and flies her around to different flowers. And then when she feeds, and of course the pollen gets on them, and then they, well that design on that is the shape of one of those beetles. So these male bees come along and go, oh, there's a female. Well, no female there, but, oh, well, I'm here, I might as well eat. Gets the pollen on him, and then he's helping to pollinate how did the flower know to do that? I mean, you listen to like these Nova shows and these nature shows. Well, nature's very clever. No, that's chance purposeless processes. Nature is not clever. <laughs> How did that flower know to evolve like that? How did that flower even know those bees exist? It didn't. So teleology is, how do they know? How do they know? It's, it knows that. How does, how does chlorophyll work? How does it know to convert that energy? So there's theological, ontological has to do with the being. Um, intelligent design is a really good argument. I know that's controversial in Christian corners because some think it's um, sort of like trying to teach the Bible without creation, but that's not the point. Intelligent design isn't, it has nothing to do with religion, it has to do with science. And I like using this for people who are very scientific and don't want to talk about Bible. I can talk intelligent design with them and get them to the point of God is probable. And then the historicity of scripture, miracles, archaeological evidences. So you see, it's like the threefold cord is not easily broken. You know, you tie one string to a bucket of sand and try and pick it up and it breaks and you wind two together and gets a little farther up and it might break. And you wind more and more of these strands together, you can lift that bucket up. Circumstantial evidence can prove someone did it. So that's what apologetics is about, is we have a reasonable faith. It's totally reasonable. Now, I don't know if you guys... Really, the point of this isn't that you have to remember who John Paul Sartre was or Camus or, or uh, Bertrand Russell or all these other specifics. The point is, you have a reasonable faith. Don't, don't get, don't have doubts when you hear the atheists tell you it's a myth. Because frankly, we have reason on our side. So, remember I was talking about that. I said, so are, is this the noble lie? Is this a leap of faith? Well, no, because on that lower story where they have reason equals pessimism, we have reason equals Christianity. We have no upper story. We don't have a problem living consistently with Christianity. The problem with the humanist problem is they can't live consistently, right? They know this reason, but they, they're living a lie otherwise. We don't do that. 
Christianity, we can live consistently with our beliefs. We don't always do that, right? If we, if we could, then probably Jesus wouldn't have needed to go to the cross. But, so we have... So we have all these, we have the confidence now to go forth and not be um, persuaded by the atheists or have them fill our heads with doubt, but we have confidence in what we believe. How we incorporate this in, in witnessing, just to conclude, no, you know, just this couple of lessons don't make you apologeticists and you may not be able to use this. It'll, it should build your confidence. But just keep in mind, when it comes to witnessing, first of all, to me, it's always the leading of the Holy Spirit. Time is a factor. If you just meet somebody, a, you know, a chance meeting or something, and you get to talking about, yeah, hit them with the gospel. You don't have, you're not going to have time to explain cosmologies and <laughs> all this kind of stuff. But hit them with the gospel. But if you have a long-term relationship with somebody, you know, you know, maybe you work with somebody, you can hit on these things every now and then and try and bring them along, you know. But you just got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, whatever situation you're at. And I'm not trying to minimize the power of the gospel, the Word of God. But I mean, there are some people that'll do that to you. Don't don't even go there. I don't want to hear that. Talk to the hand because I'm not listening. Okay. That's a little harder, okay? And just remember, it was Paul when he went up Mars Hill. What was he looking for? He was looking at all those gods. He was looking like, what is an inroad to these people? How can I present the gospel to them? And he saw that, that monument to the unknown God because they were so afraid of offending any God that they might have forgotten to the unknown God. That's it. That's my way in. So he looked to their culture. So we look to the culture of the atheist, and we say, that's my road in. He thinks I have an unreasonable faith. He thinks that he's okay. I'm going to show him that he's not okay, and I'm going to show him that my faith is reasonable. 